Hi everyone, I'm John Fenzel here at Washington's Crossing in New Jersey, right across the Delaware River. We came here today because it's the exact time of the year, 242 years ago, when George Washington and his Continental Army of Patriots launched one of the most important raids of our history. Of course, you've heard the story. It all began in the summer of 1776 and things were going well for the American colonists in their revolutionary struggle for freedom against Great Britain. But then the empire struck back. In August, the British landed the largest armada that the world had ever seen right off of Long Island, New York, with an army of 30,000 troops. General George Washington said that he'd rather burn New York to the ground than leave it to the British, but that didn't happen. Very quickly, the British routed Washington's smaller force and drove them over here south through New Jersey. Washington barely escaped, and in that retreat, there was a journalist named Thomas Paine who did a really good job of summing up the gravity of this situation when he famously wrote, these are the times to try men's souls. Washington's army was demoralized, to say the least. When they reached the Delaware, Washington seized all the boats and retreated across, using the river as a temporary buffer. But everybody knew that it was just a matter of time before they'd be attacked again and probably annihilated in the process. It was so bad that Congress had fled from Philadelphia, and even Washington confessed at the time that the game is pretty near up. Washington knew that he had to come up with something not just fast, but also dramatic and fast to keep everything together. Imagine carrying that burden on your shoulders. I'm going to uh, turn this camera around just so you can see the crossing site. Because on top of it all, he also knew that he was a wanted man. In fact, the most wanted man in all the colonies. And to that end, he was actively being hunted. Washington was a young man at the time. He was 44 years old. So, okay, you know, just think about that for just a second. Not only does the fate of the entire revolution depend on your leadership and your plans entirely, but if things don't work out, you know that you're going to be hung as a traitor to the crown. So no pressure. Now, just imagine the situation in December of 1776. Washington's army has just retreated from New York, giving up the entire city to the British. His soldiers were exhausted, just having fled through New Jersey here all the way to Pennsylvania. When they arrive here, his troops are at their very lowest. They're discouraged. They're hungry. They're cold. They lack blankets and shoes and even the basic necessities to fight. In fact, a lot of his soldiers were really sick and weren't in any shape to do much of anything. And if that's not bad enough, that about 1,000 soldiers are due to leave the army when their enlistments expire in just a few months. Just as he's doing his level best to fix those problems, there's more bad news. When Rhode Island and much of New Jersey also falls into British hands. For those living in Philadelphia, it isn't hard to imagine that their capital will be the very next to go. And yet, on December 20th, General John Sullivan arrives with 2,000 soldiers from New England, one glimmer of light in that heart of darkness. And so it's at this point, it's obvious to General Washington that he needs to use his suddenly now larger army to achieve a big strategic victory, or the revolution is just going to be over for good. Conkey's uh, Ferry Inn is, is right up uh, the river a ways here. It's the 18th century inn and tavern that was owned by Samuel McConkie, who was an absolute hero. Even though he wasn't a soldier, his uh, support helped immensely in the Continental Army's ability to cross the Delaware River. The inn served as a guard post during the Continental Army's encampment in Bucks County in December of 1776. Earthworks and cannon defended the ferry landing, and according to tradition, this inn is where Washington and his aides ate their dinner prior to crossing the Delaware River on Christmas Day. The, the password uh, that Washington came up with was terse, it was accurate, victory or death. And so what happened over the next 24 hours changed the world, and I'm going to turn the camera here just so that you can see this site here on the Pennsylvania side of the Delaware River where on Christmas Day, Continental troops marched from as far away as Newtown in the rain and the cold to join soldiers already encamped near McConkie's Ferry. Late in the afternoon, Washington assembles his small army. They march to the river right here. The crossing boats 
are just up the way and we're going to go see some of those reproductions. They're positioned, they're loaded, is ordered, and Washington deploys scouts to the outskirts of Trenton. And they had a, a brief engagement here with the British troops here, the Hessians, but somehow, unbelievably, really, the British don't see them as any kind of significant threat. The German Hessian commander never expects a full attack from Washington's army. He doesn't think that Washington is even really capable of it. As darkness falls, the rain becomes a driving storm of snow and sleet and wind. And sailors from Massachusetts and the Pennsylvania Navy ferry the 2,400 troops across this river, which was icy at the time under General Washington's close supervision. Durham boats, which are just over here and will make our way in this direction, are used to carry pig iron and other cargo. They carry soldiers across the river with a current that's moving fast. And you can see this current right in front of us. It's very fast. Artillery and frightened horses are on the ferry. They're crossing the Delaware. Most of the soldiers are standing in these uh, crowded Durham boats, completely exposed to the elements. They have no headgear, no shoes. Their feet are blistered. They're bleeding. They're frostbitten. They're wrapped in cloth and rags. You have horses and light cannons that are being transported on the same boats as the horses. So this is just an absolutely major operation. As if crossing an icy river at night was hard enough without also bringing the artillery pieces with them. Washington and his commanders wanted that extra firepower. And so in all, the Continentals bring 18 cannons over the river. They have three pounders and four pounders and six pounders and horses and enough ammunition, they think and they hope, for the battle that they knew was soon to come. So, so just think about this. You have these six pounders, which weigh as much as 1,750 pounds and are by far the most difficult to transport to this far side of the river. But in the end, all that trouble proves to be well worth it because the boats have to make it across the river and multiple times. The army isn't ready to march until four o'clock in the morning, so it's too late for the attack to be executed as planned. I'm not sure if we can get over there or not. No, I don't think we can. But those are the Durham boats that you see right there. They're reproductions. So our army presses on. They hope that they can still surprise the British in their barracks in Trenton, New Jersey, which is just, as the crow flies, seven miles away, but the, uh, the way they marched, it was about nine miles because they go slightly inland. Washington and his contingent of uh, more experienced troops cross right here. They take the, uh, this upstream route that is most challenging to negotiate. They land at McConkie's and Johnson's Ferries. Johnson Ferries right on the other side just to give them the advantage of surprise in their approach. By the time that most of the soldiers reach the launching point for the boats, the drizzle is turned into this just absolutely driving rain. And by 11 o'clock that evening, while the boats were crossing the river, you have this howling northeaster that was making the crossing even more miserable and even worse. And so then you have General Ewing and Colonel Cadwallader and their troops are to cross just to the south of us, but the icy conditions prevent their crossing and temperatures for the crossing, keep in mind, are around 29 degrees. They have brisk winds and uh, later records say that it blew a perfect hurricane as the snow and the sleet lashed Washington's army. With every delay, Washington becomes more and more concerned that his army will be caught in the open and at this point he's just absolutely got to make a decision. Washington is seen brooding on this crate near a fire right along this area. He wrote uh, about that fateful moment as he was certain there was no making a retreat without being discovered. He said that he's going to push on at all events. So it, it takes the army about four hours to march from the river crossing site to the outskirts of Trenton and so at eight o'clock in the morning the attack is launched and American troops take the Hessians at Trenton completely by surprise. British troops pour into the streets from their abandoned houses where they were camping out. 
but Henry Knox positions his cannons at the end of the streets. They point him directly down the road at them and at the top of the town where its fire commanded the very, very center of the town of Trenton. There are about 1,380 Hessian soldiers in and around Trenton at the start of the battle. They fire and the Hessian soldiers scatter and retreat. Their commander did their best to rally him and flank the Continental Army troops. What they see instead is General George Washington right out in front in full view leading his men in the attack against them. So the battle for Trenton is over in, in less than an hour and about 900 Hessian soldiers are taken prisoner. The Hessian commander is mortally wounded and amazingly only a few American soldiers are injured. Among those wounded is future U.S. President James Monroe who crossed the American forces and was part of that raiding party. So they're carrying these captured supplies and prisoners and Washington's troops recross this icy Delaware with their Hessian POWs, about 900 of them, muskets, cannons, supplies. The British don't have any boats, so they have no ability to pursue or to counterattack. So that's pretty dramatic, right? But wait, there's more because on January 2nd and 3rd, the Americans again crossed the Delaware River. They defeated the British in the Second Battle of Trenton and in the Battle of Princeton, driving the British so far back that the Continental Army goes into winter quarters in, in New Jersey. So, okay, looking back, consider this just for a moment, the victory Washington and his army achieved here, right here on this ground, you really can't understate its importance. It was arguably the most important strategic success in our nation's history. George Washington used this victory brilliantly to restore faith in his cause with the Continental Army and with Congress. It's, so it's important really to note that this and all of the follow-on victories not only boosted the morale of the army, but also inspired the patriots of, of the colonies. And many of the soldiers who were due to leave the army agreed to extend their service and more recruits joined up right after that. So this victory at Trenton absolutely shook the British Empire to its core and it saved our young nation and completely revitalized the American War for Independence. And so the next day, the Congress authorized Washington to raise 16 additional infantry regiments, three artillery regiments, and 3,000 cavalry along with a host of, of other uh, mandates. So this was just an extraordinary, daring, heroic victory by any standard. And so 242 years later, we're here still as the United States of America, not bowing to any crown. So just think about that. Merry Christmas to everybody and a Happy New Year. I thought you'd like to know.